Hello and welcome to the Beauty Chronicles. I'm Meredith Jones, a professor of gender studies who loves popular culture. And I'm Carla, Meredith's sidekick. In these Beauty Chronicles, <laughs> we're going to discuss all sorts of fascinating and sometimes grotesque things to do with cosmetic surgery, media, popular culture, celebrity, and much more. If you're confused by the Kardashians or baffled by Botox, this is the place to be. We're happy with the title because some of the uh, chat GTP suggestions mm. um, were quite funny. Oh, yeah. So the, I think what we decided on was Beauty Chronicles, Insights into Cosmetic Surgery Culture and Beyond with Professor Meredith Jones. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Thanks, chat GTP. Should I, I... Is it better than The Beauty Blend, Hilarious Tales of Cosmetic Adventures, Kardashian Culture? And Dr. Meredith Jones. <laughs> I'd like to tell hilarious tales about myself. That was when I said, um, Could you give me something a bit more humorous, something that makes people laugh. Yeah, there will Maybe be hilarious laugh. tales, but some, some won't be. That's true. We can't promise hilarity. We can't promise laughing our curves off a hilarious journey into body image and pop culture with Professor Meredith Jones. Well, imagine if you could laugh your curves off. You probably so, can. Well, we need to do, well, people cry and vomit their curves off with Ozempic. So we need to do another podcast about Ozempic and similar um, drugs that people are taking to lose weight fast. They certainly don't laugh them off. They, they sort of nauseate their curves off. But it's today we're gross. talking about the kind of almost the pre ozempic world, um, the world before, well, the, maybe the blip, almost a blip where curves have been fashionable. Curves came in and are gradually falling out of fashion at the moment, which is what the, I think what the Brazilian butt lift is all about. Maybe, maybe you can explain what it is. Um, right. So, uh, I try not to rustle my papers. It's okay. It's just um, more authentic if we hear that. So have you seen a pic, uh, like a before and after, after picture of the Brazilian butt lift? Have you, have you looked at it? I think any? I probably, I haven't, I think I've probably like, like I probably know what Kim Kardashian's butt looks like mm. just cause it's kind of impossible not to have seen at least mm. a couple of images swing by yeah well and i'm assuming that her that she's had a butt lift her butt whether it's brazilian i don't know <laughs> right uh well her butt uh allegedly is partly the cause of surgery but of course we don't know that but this is what you know a lot of people say this um, probably the best pictures to see to see what people really understand a Brazilian butt lift to look like. The best pictures are the ones of Kim Kardashian in the vintage Dior bikini in Mexico. So if you just Google vintage Dior Kim Kardashian Mexico, and then if you see a side on pic. The Dior bikini. Yeah, the vintage Dior. Mm, vintage. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, then what you see in profile is quite a slim leg, a very slim waist, and then a butt that poke that really pokes out, um, and that almost looks like um, a a cushion inside her bikini. So it's a kind of shape that doesn't necessarily exist in nature, although we, of course, have no idea whether Kim Kardashian has really had any surgery on her butt. Um, but the Brazilian butt lift in general looks like a kind of added on butt. And sometimes it's called bubble butt, used to be called bubble butt. Um, people who are deriding the 
Brazilian butt lift now and sort of helping it to fall out of favour through narrative are using a, a really derogatory term, which is diaper butt. Mm. And they are saying that it basically looks like you've got a nappy full, a full nappy. Um, so you've got this skinny little body with a great big mm. bum that kind of hangs mm. down slightly. But that's not a nap. It's not like a cotton nappy, like the nappies of our childhood. It's more like a a diaper. Yeah, I, yeah, I, th- I think disposable diaper that tends exactly. to balloon out in that way. Exactly, because the nappies of our time, all the poo just fell out. It, well, <laughs> uh, yeah, and then there was no, yeah, okay, yeah. And how yeah. did it? How did it yeah. become Brazilian? Is it because everyone well, went to Brazil to get one? Well, partly because it, partly because. For decades in Brazil, a larger bottom has been more fashionable than, for example, large breasts. So in the 80s, when people like Pamela Anderson were huge and and were really, really famous in the West for their enormous breasts and breast implants, but really had no butts to speak of, people in Brazil thought were kind of horrified by that because they thought for all sorts of cultural reasons that large breasts were matronly. Large breasts indicated middle age matronly, but a high round bottom was very attractive. Mm -hmm. So Brazil has a, a massive, incredible history of all sorts of cosmetic surgery. And the kind of father of Brazilian cosmetic surgery is someone called Ivo Patangi. And he's He's a national icon in Brazil. Um, he owns an island. He's incredibly wealthy. And he believes that everyone has the right to cosmetic surgery. Uh, so he has a series of free clinics along with all of the ones that he charges money for. And so it's called the Brazilian butt lift because people think, well, people at least attribute the kind of invention or the development of certain techniques to him. Mm. And he was certainly at the centre of that, whether, you know, I think it was a group effort by probably by a lot of surgeons over several years. I don't think anyone actually invented it. Mm. Mm. So do you want to know what it actually is physically? I feel like (laughs) I'm going to have to know. I don't know that I want to, but. Yeah, I'm sorry, Carla. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Um. Well, it's it falls under this suite of cosmetic surgery procedures called gluteoplasty. And gluteoplasty uh, actually can be medically used. So if, for example, you've got a very damaged glute, very damaged glute, say from a car crash or something, then you might need something in there like an implant so that you can actually walk properly, mm-hmm. right? Because our glutes, I think they're our biggest muscle. Are they? I've heard that at some point. Anyway, glutes are pretty important. Um, And if you don't have them or if they're damaged or atrophied or something, then things can be done, you know, to help you because you may not be able to walk properly without them, basically, let alone sit down, I guess. Um, So one way, one form of gluteoplasty is to have implants, And that was the way people used to make their butts bigger for cosmetic purposes. But there are a lot of problems with that. Um, As you can imagine, um, you know, they're basically the same as breast implants. And there are some hilarious tales of people getting breast implants in their butts or butt implants in their breasts, either by accident or because their surgeon was incompetent or doing it on the cheap. Um, and they're obviously the wrong shape. But if you can imagine sitting on your breast implants, which are made of silicon or salon, salon that's not really a good idea. You yeah, know, if they, I had breast implants, I'd be able to imagine that. Yeah, I should have said on one's breast implants rather than yours, Carla. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's like sitting on a couple of balls of silicon. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but also the problem with implants of any sort in your body is that your body doesn't want them, right? So we tend to reject them and there are a lot of 
lot of problems with rejection, et cetera. But the BBL actually is not implants, Mm -hmm. not technically. So the BBL has three stages. Um, It's, and basically they are liposuction, fat transfer, and liposculpture. So most commonly the BBL consists of liposuction followed by lipo injection of what's called the harvested fat. And the official name for this is autologous fat transfer. Yeah. So there are a few places online that you can watch the actual, um, an actual video of it. And I'll put quite an honest one. I mean, if I can, I'll put it in, in the links for, for anyone to, for our one listener to have a look at. (laughs) Um, Um, Is it possible, are there, are there butt lifts that kind of take fat from the bottom of the butt and put it on the top of the butt? Uh, Yes, yes. In fact, what most people have is the fat taken from, well, obviously from parts they don't want it taken from. Mm. So, yes, you can have it taken from the upper thigh or the lower butt. Mm -hmm. You can have it taken from your uh, abdomen area. You can even have it taken from your face, although even the fattest face doesn't get much fat sucked out of it. And you need Mm. a lot of fat Mm. to build a butt, Mm. right? Mm. So, Or you can have it taken from arms. But the basic idea is that you have it taken out of parts of your own body. Then it goes into a machine where um, the fat is separated or, let's say, purified and I see you're pulling a face, Carla. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. The well, purification is a beautiful thing. Mm. Yeah. The only thing is that the liposuction that I've seen, where they they did this first part, they didn't put it back into the person on, on the operation I saw. But um it smells like a roast dinner. So this is so disgusting. Yeah. 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 So it smells like a roast dinner, which, you know, for a vegan, it was it was particularly gross um anyway so so the the fat is sucked out then it's put into a machine and and separated out uh, with, mm. using kind of centrifugal force mm. uh mm. so bits of tissue are separated out uh blood um and anything that's that's not fat mm. And then that fat as fast as possible. So this has to be done done fast because mm-hmm. guess what? I didn't know this. Fat is living tissue. Mm. I have always thought of fat as this disgusting, dead, hideous, yellow thing that just shouldn't be there in our bodies. But, of course, that's not the case. It's actually living tissue. Um, well, that, we makes, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of cells in a body. It's, you know. Or it's bio like exactly yeah you know, but i think it has a, it, it's a biological thing it's not some kind of that's you know, right i think we're we're taught to hate fat so much you know our culture has such a visceral reaction to this disgusting thing supposedly called fat that we yeah i mean i i certainly never thought of it as a living thing but a Mm-hmm. but it is. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be done really fast. You can't let it die. You can't be out of the body for very long. So basically then it's injected back into the body, into the parts where you want it. And that all sounds kind, it, even though I've described some quite disgusting things, it still sounds better than it really is because the word injection We think of syringes, you know, that just go into our arms or something, but they're not syringes at all, right? They're cannulas. They're enormous straws. They can be as long as a person's arm. They can be, you know, they're basically like a straw, either a small or a big straw, steel. And you do need to have little cuts in the skin to get them in. And then the surgeon actually kind of moves them round really fast. This is to get the fat out. And they they, they op- you operate the pump with their foot 
So they're almost like a pianist, like they're doing stuff with their hands, they're doing stuff with their foot. And the the liposuction procedure that I saw, the surgeon was absolutely working up a sweat, right? He was working really hard and it took hours. It's really shoveling. Yeah, absolutely. Shoveling is is the right um the right motion that he was doing. Is this yeah. the most disgusting procedure in in the Beauty Chronicles? That you, is, will this be the most disgusting procedure that you describe? I think it could be. Oh, okay. I think it could be. It's yeah. Sort of relief, because oh my god. Okay. Okay, so it's all uphill from here, basically. If we <laughs> begin. <laughs> With these, yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, so multiple cuts together. But how do you sculpt it then? If he's, if well, then he or she yeah. is shoveling it in, is there then some once it's in there, there's a bit of like massage and uh, there know. can be mass. Oh, once it's put back in, yeah. uh, no, I haven't seen anyone massage it, but that could be a thing. But like basically, how do they shape it into a nice butt shape. Oh, or they, well, or is that just, well, the, just the, the using. Skin? Using a different sort of cannula that then that then injects it back in into the places that they want. Right, it. but it's kind of the the skin surrounding it or that contains it is sort of what gives it its shape. I don't really know. It's not like okay. you're filling up a balloon because right. you're in you're sort of injecting it into flesh. So oh, okay. So actually, one of the ways that aficionados kind of shame each other about having an obvious Brazilian butt lift or or one of the ways people who I call uh, cosmetic surgery literate, right, mm-hmm. can spot or say they can spot a Brazilian butt lift is because they're always a bit lumpy, mm-hmm. right? So like, a, like some other cosmetic surgery procedures, it makes you look better with clothes on. Mm-hmm. And worse with clothes off. And mm-hmm. that's actually the case with liposuction too, because liposuction, you don't get a smooth contour. You'll mm-hmm. get a smaller shape, mm-hmm. which will make your, your jeans look, you know, tighter or whatever. Mm. But um, in the nude, you're a bit lumpy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So people often say with lipo, oh, it'll make you look better in clothes, but worse nude. Mm. Yeah. So the BBL is, I think, almost always a bit lumpy, but Carla, there does get does get a little slightly more gross at this point. Just to tell you about one of the risks, and it potentially happens to a small degree with every single Brazilian butt lift, and that is that not all the fat survives. And when it dies, it goes hard and lumpy and the skin outside it can go black. Um, so you can end up with, it's called fat necrosis, you know, just means fat death. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I, I'm i not sure, but I think that those lumps that we see on most BBLs after you know six months or so are little bits of fat necrosis and the in the worst situations it kind of gets wounds and and goes black yeah so black areas and hard lumps Mm. okay i mean Mm. yeah okay how can that be more attractive than just having a bump that isn't enormous is it th- this is what I never understand yeah. about kind of yeah. cosmetic? Like I get that people want to look different, mm. and you know you can yeah. do this and yeah. da, 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 da. But at some point, it's kind of like God. People mm. just end up down this rabbit hole that they it, can't get out of, and yeah. to, to, it's sort of they're so far in it that to kind of truly, yeah, like they just have a they can't not see. They can't. Sorry, I'm just. I can't speak. It's it's been a bit overwhelming. This. Is... Yeah, yeah. You're speechless. <laughs> understandably, honey. It's totally understandable. Um, you, you need a valium. Yeah, um, like at you know, what the, point the rabbit hole they... is quite right. I mean, with any cosmetic surgery, you it's very hard down. to stop at one. Yeah. yeah. So, and in fact, 
because of the way capitalism works and the way the beauty system works, one leads to another. So Mm. in the old days of cosmetic surgery, you would, uh, not you, one, one, Thank you. If one wished and if one was of that very tiny percent, we've got to remember that most people still don't get cosmetic surgery. Mm. Most it's people in the mo- world still don't do it. Yeah, it's just that most people we see on our screens yes. have. Ha- have had something or are filtered to look like they have. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it used to be that one might have got one facelift in one's life maybe one breast, one, well, two breast implants, you know, one in each breast. Mm. That, that Unless was in, they were a bit lopsided. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Pamela Anderson's day, let's say. But now with all of these new procedures and things like BBLs that lead to other surgeries, we've got people visiting their cosmetic surgeons um, maybe at least twice a year. So whereas a celebrity might have visited a surgeon once every 10 years back in the day, now they're there twice a year. And something like a BBL, because it doesn't last, it may droop, but most importantly, it is currently, for example, falling out of fashion. Um one will be back at one surgeon saying, please modify my BBL or remove it completely if possible, mm. uh, et cetera. Mm. Yeah. But you were asking why would anyone want this, uh, you know, and it's a fantastic question. Well, just like, when it's so, it goes so wrong, it goes so bad. Yeah. Well, It's a really hard aesthetic to understand, especially if, like you and me, like I don't know how old you are, but I'm 57 Mm. and I grew up in kind of white suburban Australia Mm. Um, and the aesthetic we wanted in the the 80s when, which was, you know, the last time I wore a bikini, uh, was pretty flat, like it was really Mm. boyish. Mm. It was pre-Kate Moss, so boobs were still okay. We we hadn't hit heroin chic yet, but it was basically the thinner the better. And you might have a little bum and little boobs, but but that was all all you wanted. And certainly when I hit puberty and grew grew hips and grew breasts, I would I couldn't have been more horrified. Mm. Right, that was an absolute trauma, and. In fact, there's an amazing artist who's who's done a lot of work with cosmetic surgery called Orlan, a French artist, and she's written or spoken very, very eloquently about the trauma of puberty for her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for a lot of women, maybe men as well, puberty, especially if you were living in a culture that didn't value curves, puberty was a trauma. So because your body suddenly did things that you really didn't want it to do. Anyway, that's a bit of a sideline. But basically I grew up in an era where having a big big bum was was in no way attractive and was something to work against. Um, So we used to starve ourselves to get rid of our bums. That was that having a big bum was a nightmare. Um, and if you had a big bum, you do you would do everything to hide it. But then a few things began to change in popular culture. J Lo kind of began to um, popularize curves. By today's standards, BBL standards, J Lo's curves are tiny now, you know. Mm-hmm. But she was lauded for being quite curvaceous. Same with Beyonce. And we also saw the rise of hip-hop and the kind of globalisation of hip-hop, which for the first time showcased black women's bodies that that were more, uh, you know, I think the word was bootylicious. But really then along came Kim Kardashian. I think in many ways the first white woman to popularise the big butt 
And if we look at one of the very first Keeping Up With the Kardashian episodes, I think it might have been the actual first episode, we get Kim's mum, we get Kim opening a fridge and I think a close-up of her butt. And at this point, Kim was very young and really looked quite different to how she looked now, both in her body and in her face. And we get her mum, Kris Jenner, the mummager of all time, mocking Kim's butt. And I think the phrase was, she's got a little junk in the trunk. No, the phrase was, I think she has a little junk in the trunk. And Kim was being mocked in the family kitchen by her own mother. She was being body shamed, right? No doubt about it body shamed by her own mother in front of her sisters, and they were all having a good laugh at the size of Kim's butt. Because it was too big. It was too big. She had a little junk in the trunk. Of course, Kris Jenner went on to found a multi-billion dollar industry, if you count all of her daughter's wealth put together and her wealth, on that butt, mm. right? They literally built their industry on that butt that was at first ridiculed by them. It makes me angry, actually, because I think, I mean, any sort of body shaming is horrendous, but to come from your own mother in your own kitchen, I just feel. And I haven't seen. I, I haven't seen any Kim Kardashian episode. You don't have to. Let alone that one. But I'm just wondering, was it clearly, like, were people clearly laughing at her? Was she feeling uh, insulted? Was Kim feeling insulted? Or my cynical view is, was this actually completely intentional? We're going to open this show on on what we think is going to be the most contentious piece of eye candy we've got. Mm. You know, I I'm a little. I'm a little more. Hmm, have they kind mm. of engineered this somewhat? Why are they? Or, or the, the show's producers have kind of decided that this is this is how we're going to set up the the entire series, and then we build. You know, yeah, we build a conversation around it. Some people like it. Some people don't. We're going to make out that he's the villain. You know, like the, the mum doesn't like the Bart, but you know the boyfriends love it, and Kim's going to like learn to be proud of it. And meanwhile we'll build a multi-billion dollar empire off this ongoing conversation about beauty. But it all starts with this kind of Kim's butt. Yeah. Which can kind of, yeah, which is symbolic for like every other piece of cultural like I gender, think he, like yeah. in multiracial, like, you know, race. Everything sits on that butt. Yeah. I mean, I think you've you've really, really encapsulated it there really beautifully, how conscious they were that that butt would really, in a way, be the star of the show and in a way then become the star of Instagram and of all sorts of popular culture. I don't know. I think early in, you know, you've got to remember Kim Kardashian was Paris Hilton's sidekick. Yeah. Right. And you don't get anyone with less butt than Paris Hilton. Yeah. You know, Paris Hilton is was the quintessential fashionable body pre-Kardashian body, and, mm. and that body's now coming back. Um, so I think the ridicule was real, but I think that they also knew that there was something here, mm. that there was – they knew that Kim was already being considered a great beauty. Mm. They that also she would never have a small butt. That she'd never have a small butt. And to... what's more, that she was proud of it. Yeah. So whether she, I mean, when I, even now when I watch that scene, and I've probably watched it about five or six times mm-hmm. over the years, even now I feel for Kim. Like I feel like I'm that girl opening the fridge and my mum's mocking me. You were hooked from oh. the start. Oh, you were hooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was. Although I, did, I didn't get into it until late. Like I had to catch up. Mm. Um, but Kim, the Kim's reaction is that she smiles. 
Mm-hmm. She knows she's beautiful. She knows her butt is an asset. She's already got boyfriends who absolutely love it. And crucially, the boyfriends are black. Um, oh, and that's watch, now I want to watch this opening shot. I don't think it's the opening it's shot, oh, but okay. it's, it's there early in the early. episode. And I'll I'll send you a link. Yeah. She knows what she's doing. I think she knows what she's doing. She knows she's beautiful. She knows the butt's never going to go away. I mean, she could have made the butt go away. You know, she could have had massive amounts of lipo and removed the butt. But a lot of people liked the butt. They just weren't necessarily in the mainstream. And what Kim did was she moved that butt to the mainstream. Um, So she... She really popularized the big butt and um, and a shorter body, a brunette body, a body that in those early days of the Kardashian episodes was much more accessible for normal-looking women. So whereas the majority of women in the world couldn't, you know, in a pink fit, um, do anything to end up looking like, say, Claudia Schiffer or one of the old supermodels, we could imagine ourselves looking like Kim Kardashian because she was shorter, she was uh, olive, she still is olive skinned, she was brunette, she was had sort of normal curves. Sure, she was like incredibly beautiful, but mm. she was more accessible in terms of dreaming what you could realistically look like Mm. um so that was a huge part of her appeal um and also just her confidence you know her smiling when her mum mocked her for having a big butt um so yeah thank I was like thank you Kim Kardashian in kind of the first half of all the of the keeping up with the Kardashian series, which is now ended after I think twenty one years, and they've got a new show on Hulu, Hulu now. Um, but then, of course, um, I guess the Kardashian bodies, in a way, jumped the shark, as we say, an old Happy Days reference, right? And this kind of coincides with what you mentioned before about the Brazilian butt lift going out of favour? Well, no, because first it came into favour. So instead of just, I guess, instead of, firstly, the Kardashians themselves may have allegedly had Brazilian butt lifts in order to make their curvy features even more curvy. Mm -hmm. So we got them looking more cartoonish in their own bodies. So looking Mm -hmm. like cartoon Mm -hmm. women with you know, curves that are very, very difficult to achieve in real life. Yeah, yeah. Quote, naturally. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then people emulating them. So so people emulating them and also emulating all of their emulators um, in order to get that, that curvy look. And then the curvy look became drastic. So in the same way that uh, we saw breast implants in the 80s and 90s become enormous, you know, enormous culturally, enormous in terms of media coverage and enormous practically actually huge breasts um, stuck on these skinny bodies. And, you know, Pamela Anderson was and somewhat still is the quintessential example of that very thin body with boobs stuck on. We got a similar thing with the Brazilian butt lift. We got these thin bodies with bums stuck on. So the whole aesthetic uh, took off and became extreme. And what we're now actually seeing, because technologies have advanced, Brazilian butt lifts can somewhat be reversed. Mm -hmm. You can suck that fat out. Mm -hmm. Um, And perhaps the main, one of the most famous people who's had it sucked out publicly, that is, is someone who's adjunct to the Kardashians and her name's Black China. 
So a very, very talented um, singer, actor, dancer, rapper, uh, who just happened to marry a Kardashian brother. So she married the only Kardashian brother, Rob. And she and Rob had their own reality TV show that didn't last for very long. And she last year, I think, I think it was last year, yeah, maybe just earlier this year, very publicly had her BBL removed and other kinds of things, including her lip, her lip mm. fillers removed. Uh, even had some of the operations were virtually live on social media, et cetera. Um, so the, the thing about BBLs is that you can potentially remove them, perhaps not completely, perhaps not 100% successfully. Maybe you'll still be left with quite a lumpy look, but it will be a smaller look. Um, and I think that's incredibly interesting because back in the day, cosmetic surgery was really only about looking younger mm. or getting bigger breasts. Mm. And now it's much more aligned with fashion in the sense that fashion comes and goes, things rise and fall. You know, that has to be the nature of fashion in a capitalist system because you have to want something new, otherwise you're not going to spend your money, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You have to want to chuck the old stuff out and get the new stuff. Yeah. That's and why Ikea doesn't like, you know, if your toilet paper holder breaks, you can't get a replacement because they've just renewed their product line. I love that you've made that segue from BBLs to toilet paper. Toilet paper holders. Because yeah, it's all about yeah. like the bum, right? We're in the we're in the right zone. I know. It's in the same domain. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So capitalism <gasps> kind of requires uh continuous consumption, therefore um it's creating you know yeah you need yeah. to you, you need to sort of refresh your product line if you want to continue to 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 get income exactly from, from and that. so yeah. a whole lot of things have been invented and they they're mainly the supposedly temporary or semi permanent cosmetic surgery procedures mm. but also some supposedly permanent ones um have helped to bring cosmetic surgery into the kind of realm of fashion. And I think the BBL shows that really beautifully because we, I mean, euphemisms abound, right? We've actually seen its rise and now uh, currently we're seeing its fall. So people are now having their BBLs reduced and or removed and and they're not fashionable anymore. What we're seeing now, if if we take the Kardashians as any sort of um, litmus test, we are kind of frighteningly seeing a very, very thin blonde body coming back. Okay. Very, very thin blonde body coming back. Um, is, is it the same sort of across the board, across the world, or you're just – sort of talking specifically about kind of Western culture, developed yeah, countries, I, Europe maybe, or, you know, for example, in Brazil, do they still like a big butt? Yeah, I in, don't know. In hip-hop culture in the US, like is, you know, okay, Latin culture, black culture in America, they're yeah. still into a big butt. They just, it's just sort of fashion and beauty industries kind of. So, yes, I'm talking, I'm really talking about white fashion. Mm. And one of the kind of more grotesque things about the BBL is that it really has culturally appropriated black women's bodies for a time, mm. and now it's busy discarding them. Mm. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of really good stuff about that. You know, Teen Noir on, you, has a fantastic YouTube channel. She's spoken about this at length. Yes, Tinoir is fabulous to to go and look at to learn more about the actual cultural appropriation um, around the BBL, particularly connected uh, to white women and to the Kardashians. And so, what are the signs in the Kardashians that, um, like, have they themselves had? Are they starting to dye their hair blonde and go on? It's always hard to know whether. 
Yeah, well. They're doing their 36-hour fasts to burn body fat. Well, who knows? Because allegedly, we don't know. Um, But they've certainly all become very, very slim. So it used to be that, well, in my eyes, it used to be that Kendall Jenner, who's who's the supermodel of the Kardashians, she's an actual supermodel, mm-hmm. um, she was the thin one, right? Mm-hmm. She had a, a – and by the way, that supermodel body never changed with the BBL. It's – it's it supermodels, if they got BBLs, they were tiny, mm-hmm. right? So we've had that static supermodel body that hasn't changed uh, throughout this whole trend of the BBL. Um, so anyway, Kendall was always the thinnest. To my eyes now, Kim and Chloe, no, sorry, not, yes, Kim and Chloe, I sometimes get them mixed up, look thinner than Kendall to me, especially in their arms. They look like they've got stick arms and that could be filters, that could be um, liposuction, it could be dieting. But Kendall suddenly looks quite robust to me and her body hasn't changed mm. uh, while Kim and Chloe especially, and I think now to some degree Chris, their mum, have really, really become tiny. Mm. And maybe one of the ways they've done that is with removal of BBLs, with certain kinds of dieting that could potentially be um, pharmaceutically assisted, Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly with the absolute best personal trainers in the world and access to all of the new technology and incredible gyms and and admittedly, you know, incredible hard work. The Kardashians' bodies are the tools of their trade Mm. and they're quite open about that. So they have to work very, very hard on these bodies, and they do, you know. um, uh, Chloe and Kim especially um, are very, very open about working out every day, uh, working out hard every day. Now, if working out Even if you worked out all day, every day, if you could achieve those bodies, I don't know without other stuff, but certainly their bodies have changed dramatically. They've become much thinner and uh, and they're embracing the blonde. Mm. Yeah, now. So we're getting a real, we're in the middle of a, of a body fashion change, I think, and I don't know where it's going to settle. I think extreme thinness obviously isn't sustainable. Mm. I mentioned it to my personal trainer the other day and she was absolutely shocked when I told her that thin was coming back. Mm. She was like, no, no, no. I thought thin was gone forever. I thought we were going to, you know, celebrate strength. But certainly if you look at these new arms that Kim and Chloe have, doesn't look like there's any strength in those arms at all. Yeah, they look pretty. I was looking at at some pictures. Yeah. And uh, they look pretty skinny. Yeah. I mean, kind of. It doesn't look like they've been doing much working out, to be honest. Yeah. Well, you know. there's there's workouts and workouts. I mean, you can work out yeah, just to lose weight. Just walking on a treadmill, like anyway, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, but it's also hard to know. It's filters, what pictures, filters, and yeah. the lens is taken, yeah. and the yada yada. And the way um, you sit, like if you actually watch some some face to camera from the most recent shows. You'll see that uh, Kim and Chloe especially never move their arms from their bodies. So if you imagine, all right, I'm doing it now. I'm pulling my shoulders back. Yeah, I'm right. pushing my elbows into my ribs and suddenly, hey, I'm looking at myself, look how skinny my arms are all of a sudden, right? And then if I only gesture by kind of 
lifting my hands up and never moving my elbows from my ribs, then yeah, I look. Yeah, you always look. Yeah, look yeah. how look that. Yeah, they're tiny. They're tiny. They're I know. No, I've just got stick. suddenly. I've got stick arms. I will say, mm. Kylie Jenner mm. is way more beautiful than. Well, she's Chloe. Like she's. At least the photos I'm seeing. I, like yeah, I just well, don't know anything about these women, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think I can mm. say without being sued that yeah. they have all had what most people would consider to be a lot of cosmetic surgery, mm. mm -hmm. and some of them admit to some procedures. In fact, I think they all admit to at least one. Um, although I'm not sure I've ever seen Kim actually admit to any. Why is um, Kim's name surname Kardashian and Kylie's surname is Jenner? Because Are they've they got they've got different dads. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Is the short answer. That's all I need. And for anyone who's upset about me calling Caitlin Jenner um Kylie's dad, uh Caitlin the wants time. to be dad. Yeah. And Kylie does call her dad. So yeah. Caitlin Jenner, yes, she's a woman and and she's Kylie's dad. Um okay. So <sighs> oh man. This has been a journey, right? I don't know that I can go. Off how are you feeling? How, how, oh. To be honest, I feel better than I did at the start of this okay. of this recording. Okay. Look, I watch this stuff so you don't have to. I'm definitely not going to watch any of this stuff. Oh, my yeah. God. Forget it. I've okay. even, like, I can just have, I've got the smell of. Um, Roast dinner. Purifying mm. body fat mm. in my nostrils. Mm. It reminds me a bit of, like, I'm smelling the time that we roasted a goose for Christmas. Oh, my God. And the, the amount of fat it produced was. We were really? we were shoveling that fat out of the oven as oh, the goose wow. roasted. There was so much of it. That's the smell that came into my nostrils as you described yeah. the, uh, yeah. the quote purification process. Mm. I'm sorry, um, but yeah, I feel okay. Do we so need what, to cover anything more? How long I feel I've talking? kind of. I mean, I've said it in a very different way to what I planned, but. Um, that's the whole point, right? Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting to know that thin is coming back in, which, mm. you know, it's kind of, it is, it is this kind of fashion cycle, but I would like to know what's going on in Brazil and whether people are still into butt lifts there, whether there's been any shift in that culturally. Um, yes. whether they like big boobs a bit more or whether it's still considered matronly. Um, and then the other thing I'm curious about is whether any of this stuff tracks in places like South Korea where, you know, like plastic surgery is very different, popular, it, but, yeah. you know, there, there, there are different types of cosmetic surgery that are popular there for similar reasons maybe, maybe because certain things are more fashionable than others. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, certainly the shape you know, of your eyes or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Um, South Korea is a whole, a whole, almost a different world of cosmetic surgery. It's it's absolutely fascinating, and I am going to be looking into that soon um, mm. for my uh, second edition of my mm. book. Um, but yeah, my guess is that BBLs probably exist in South Korea, but in in no in no way to the extent that they do in the West, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, much more focused on faces, yeah, mm -hmm. and on thinness, mm -hmm. yeah. How do we finish? With a little song. This 
nighty was bought for me or sent to me by Ruth Holiday, who I wrote the cosmetic surgery tourism book with when I was in hospital in Germany. I can't remember what you were wearing. It wasn't the main hospital gown. We were too distracted um, by the, the monochrome quality of the vegan food. Exactly. But also remember that ancient wheelchair that you wheeled me to that restaurant in and then you got really cross because they had a step and we couldn't get the wheelchair up the step and I was so drugged that I couldn't muster any crossness. Well I was a little bit worried about the fact that we were you know we were wrestling already over the pavement and you had a foot that had almost fallen off completely. No my foot was basically broken off and mended by Dr. Sebastian, who everyone had a big crush on. Yeah, he was he was quite dashing. Yeah, I, I do still love him. <laughs>